you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the book of First Chronicles, Old Testament book, First Chronicles, chapter four. If you find Second Chronicles, go left, and you will uh, find it there. Uh, first and Second Kings, and then you get to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. If you love genealogies, this is the book for you. Uh, you start reading through this book, and uh, you'll see a lot of genealogies at the beginning. And uh, you get to like chapters, I think it's four, five, six, and seven. They're covering genealogies of, of the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And it's interesting because you, um, you read through that and you say, well, Danny, why are you doing that? Well, um, I've, I've got one of these chronological read through the Bible plans. I've never read through chronologically. It's been fascinating. It's been fun to do that. And so a while back you hit First Chronicles and you're going through it, and all of a sudden you get to chapter 4, and they tell him, you know, he begat, she begat here, and then this family, and this family. And then all of a sudden, there's an interruption. They do this every so often to where they just, the writer just stops and then pinpoints a particular individual, says something about them, and then moves on. And in this particular instance, it's a person by the name of Jabez. Now, probably about 15 years or so ago, there was a book called The Prayer of Jabez, and, the and we even uh, had a sermon on it, and uh, we encouraged people to get the book and, and look at it, read through it, and pray, pray through it. But um, this kind of caused me to revisit that and even to look at it from a little bit of a different angle. And so if you've, if you've got your Bibles, uh, on 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and uh, if you go to verse 9, They've already talked about different uh, genealogies and, and who's related to who. But then all of a sudden you get to verse 9 and it just stops. It says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. So he was in a family. There were some other brothers there. But we picked him out and said, he's more honorable than, than the brothers. Okay, more honorable. Well, when you talk about honor, God is the one that gives honor to people. So it's not like he was more honorable because all the other guys thought he was. It's because God denoted that. And he said that Jabez was more honorable than all of his brothers. He made like God's honor roll on there. And he said, hey, he's the most honorable. And so then you follow on and it says, and his mother called his name Jabez saying, because I bore him in pain. Okay, what an interesting start to this guy's life. The Hebrew word for pain sounds a lot like Jabez. So that she named him Jabez, which would always sound like pain, so that she would never forget the pain she went through in giving birth to him. Okay? All right. She is not going to be the subject of next year's Mother's Day sermon uh, over here. So... In, he, in the Hebrew uh, context, what they used to do is they would name children after certain characteristics or they'd pick up on things. If you remember uh, Esau and Jacob, when Esau and Jacob, they were twins. When they were born, Esau came out first and, uh, and then Jacob was holding on to his heel and just came right behind. So they named him Jacob, which literally means heel grabber or kind of a trickster. So that kind of stayed with him. And I was always thankful that I was not born in the Old Testament time because my dad told me, he said, Danny, when you were born and they brought you out, I looked at you, you looked like your head had been hit with a shovel. And so they would have named me Shovelhead, uh, would have been my Hebrew name. And so whenever you see any mercy that comes out of me, you realize it didn't come from my father's side of the family over there. It was strictly on my mom's side that that came from. So, uh, so between heel grabber and Shovelhead, all of a sudden, she's naming this child Jabez, which sounds like pain. So every time his name, it reminds her of that painful birth. Now, I'm going to share with this with you, and, and none of the women here, I've not heard this story from you, uh, nor anyone who's live streaming. Uh, but there at times are women who went through some difficult pregnancies, long labor, and they never let their child forget it. I don't know if you have ever seen that uh, happen, but to where that child, whenever they're talking about that child's wants, it's yes, 15 hours of labor. And they always point that out. Well, it got me thinking, if you took that today and took what Jabez did, it would be that you would name your child 15 hours of labor. How about that? 
That'd be your name. That's exactly what this is like. Pain, birth pain. And what's your name? I'm here in second grade. I got Sally Smith, you're over here. Freddie Simmons, you're over here. And, oh, 15 hours of labor. Uh, do you have a middle name? <laughs> Never again. Okay, good. Well, 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 we'll keep that there. Thank you, 15 hours of labor. So you can always remember the pain. And, and so that's Jabez. That's his life. So as he was growing up, he was always reminded of the painful birth that he had. Well, he got a terrible start, but man, something good had to happen because God said, you are more honorable than your brothers. And it comes to verse 10 where it says, Jabez called upon the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked and then they move on. Now, I remember when this prayer of Jabez came out, there were a lot of people that looked at that and said, well, what a selfish prayer. Oh, look at when it says, oh, Lord, bless me, enlarge my border or territory, enlarge my territory, keep your hand with me, keep me from harm, and keep me from pain. That was a real selfish prayer. Well, I strongly disagree with them because the last part of that sentence says, and God granted what he asked. So God's not in the business of just granting selfish, me-centered prayers. So that means there's got to be more to it. So I want us to look at it because to me it is a life-changing prayer. And I believe it is a courageous prayer that I would challenge you to pray this prayer or at least pray what his desires are in this prayer. So let's take a look at it. The four things he talks about. Number one is this, Lord bless me indeed. And I'm including the word indeed because the New American Standard and the King James Version have the word indeed. Lord, bless me indeed. And when you see indeed, it is like five exclamation points and an underline. Lord, bless me indeed. This is a man, Jabez, weighed down by the sorrow of his past, the dreariness of his presence, present, and the impossibilities of his future. And so he lifts his hands up to heaven and he cries out to God and he says, bless me indeed. What he is saying is, God, I want to, you to impart your supernatural favor on me. And I throw myself into the river of your will and your power and your purposes. I want to become wholly immersed in what God is trying to do in me, through me, and around me for his glory. I want you to drink that in for just a moment. When he says, Lord, bless me indeed, he says, Lord, I want to be right in the river of the flowing of what you're doing. I want to be immersed in your will. I want to have a life that brings honor and glory to you and everything that I do. I want to be right there in your will. And so I say, Lord, bless me indeed. I am not, sat I am not uh, satisfied with the status quo. And I want nothing more and nothing less than what God wants for me. That's it. I'm not asking for anything more, not asking for anything less. All I want is what you want for me. Lord, bless me indeed. In essence, he's putting a sheet of paper there saying, God, tell me what you want me to do. You see, in Psalm 84, verses 11 through 12, look at this and see some of the words and how they match up with what has happened in his life. It says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. The Lord bestows honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Now keep that verse up there for just a moment. Look at this. The Lord bestows favor and honor, and no good thing does he withhold from those who do what? Walk uprightly. He was more honorable than his brothers. I would assume he's someone who's walking uprightly. Our Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Blessed. Lord, bless me indeed. That means I want to trust in you fully. I want to trust in you fully. I want to uh, live a life that is totally committed to you. And so when Jabez desires the blessing of God, he is saying that I will walk uprightly and that I will trust in God. And when Jabez prays for the blessings, if you'll notice in this prayer, he doesn't put any parameters around the blessings. He doesn't say anything about what where, when, or how, it is just radical trust. Lord, bless me indeed. Sometimes that can be dangerous. Because you see, 
When we say God bless me, God does not always make those wonderful, happy packages that those blessings come in. Sometimes those blessings come in some difficult packages, but they are best for us. And this is captured by the singer-songwriter Laura Story when she wrote her song, Blessings, which we've sung here a number of times, and people have listened to it, and they're such powerful words. And she says, because what if your blessings come through raindrops? And what if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know you're near? And what if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? What if the trials in this life are your mercies in disguise? So when he says, Lord, bless me indeed, I'm ready to walk through whatever trial, I'm ready to walk through whatever storm it is, whatever it is, I want to be in your will. I want to be engulfed in who you are and what you are doing. Bless me indeed. And if it's the desire of your heart, if it is the desire of your heart, then you will build your trust in God and you will walk uprightly. You build your trust in God and you walk uprightly. So when you're sitting there and you're praying just in your normal prayer time, oh Lord, I want you to bless me. I want you to come back to these words and I hope the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Okay, I want you to build your trust in me and I want you to walk uprightly. I want you to build your trust in me, and I want you to walk upright. Lord, bless me indeed. I love the story found in 2 Kings, the account found in 2 Kings uh, chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, the prophet Elisha comes upon a widow whose husband had been a prophet, and he had died, and she didn't have any money, and she had two children, and the creditors were coming, and they were going to take her children. And she says, what can I do? He says, well, what do you have in the house? She says, I've got one little bar, one little uh, jar of oil. He said, well, I'll tell you what. Get your kids, tell them to go out through the neighborhood and tell them to find every empty vessel they can get. And the King James Version says, and borrow not a few. Borrow not a few. And so they go out and they get all these empty vessels and they bring them in and they bring them into the house. And, and she takes that jar of oil and she pours it and it fills up this vessel. Set it aside. Takes the next vessel, pours it out. <laughs> That aside, she just keeps pouring that oil. It's just like it multiplying, fills that next vessel. And she keeps doing this. And all of a sudden, she looks to her son and she says, hey, bring me another vessel. And he says, I don't have any more. That's the last one. And the oil stops. And, and she looks at Elisha and she says, uh, so what do I do? He says, well, you take all of this oil and you go and sell it, take the money, pay the creditors, keep your family, and then live on the rest. But I also think that there's a time when she looked in and she was seeing all the multiplications of oil. She stopped for a moment and would look at that prophet. And she said, Elisha, give me more oil. And Elisha would look at her and say, give me more vessels. I got to have more vessels before you can get more oil. And for us, when we pray and we say, oh, God, bless me. I need you to bless me more. God may be speaking back to you and says, listen, brother and sister, I got to tell you, I'm blessing you about all I can bless you. You got to give me some more vessels you got to give me the access codes to those other parts of your life. And if you're only willing to give me this much of your life, I'm only able to bless this much of your life. So when you're saying, give me more blessings, God is saying to you and to me, he says, you need to give me some more. If you were wanting more blessings, he said, I need to, you need to give me some more vessels. You need to open up more to your life. And this is what Jabez says. Jabez is saying, hey, Blank piece of paper. You fill it out, Lord. I'm ready to do whatever it is you want me to do. I'm open up all layers of my life. You just bless me. Bless me indeed. Okay? Now, second word, he says, is to enlarge my territory. It says border in this. I like the NIV and New American Standard where it says my territory. Enlarge my territory. There is no uninhabited territory. Either Jesus is Lord over an area or Satan has a stronghold. Either a person has received Christ or has not. Either God is honored in your business or he's not honored in your business. Either God is honored in your neighborhood or apartment complex or he's not honored in your neighborhood or complex. Jesus is either Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. And so what Jabez says, enlarge my territory. That doesn't mean give me a lake house and a beach house together. No, that means I want to take more territory for God. We are to glorify God, to advance his kingdom. We're to charge forward, to reclaim lives, and take territory for God. He says, enlarge my territory. I want you to bless me indeed. I want to walk uh, uprightly. I want to trust you, and as I trust you, I want to be someone who's advancing your kingdom. Enlarge my territory. 
enlarge my territory, expand my opportunities and my impact in such a way that I touch more lives for your glory. Would you be willing to pray that prayer? I want to expand my opportunities and my impact in such a way that I can touch more lives for your glory. Our mission statement of our church, sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. Sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. Jabez took that and he says, okay, expand my sphere of influence. Expand my sphere of influence, Lord. And it's not just so that I can get kudos, it is that I want to tell more people about Christ and I want to hit a bigger lick for the kingdom. Expand my sphere of influence. When you start asking in earnest for more influence and responsibility with which to honor God, he will bring opportunities and people into your path. We used to call them Jabez appointments. You prayed that he would enlarge your territory and all of a sudden, boom, someone comes into your pathway. Uh, Michael said a little bit, of, or you saw in the uh, video about uh, this past week when we were in New York City, I had the opportunity to sing at, at Carnegie Hall, and for our orchestra to play and our choir to sing along with Hunter Street and First Baptist Trustful, it was an amazing event. It was incredible. And you had been so proud of, of, the, of the presentation and how the gospel through all the songs, it was, it was phenomenal. But what happened is, is that we were able to expand our territory and to go into a city and begin to talk to people about who Jesus is. Because a part of the promotion was they gave people free tickets to go and give to people to come to the concert. There was a, uh, a, an amount that you could give. And so what choir members did, they would go into a store, the shop, they'd get into a conversation with the shop owner and they would give them a ticket and say, hey, I'd like for you to come. We'll be singing at Carnegie Hall. And, and the great thing was, was a number of them came back and shared testimonies of how the person who they handed a ticket to, they came with their family, stayed down front, met them afterwards, talked to them, and said, thank you so much for inviting us over here and to be a part of that. There's usually not a lot of gospel presentations happening at Carnegie Hall in New York City. I just kind of wanted to let you know that, okay? <laughs> it's not Branson, Missouri. All right, so, um, and, and so this was something different. And they do this every so often, but Wow. And we, see, we said, expand our territory, begin gospel conversation. Listen, if you're singing at Carnegie Hall, you, you're, that's a conversation starter. I mean, you go to lunch or dinner or breakfast, you pick it, and the waiter comes over and picks up on the accent and says, where are y'all from? Say, from Alabama. So what are y'all doing here? Yeah, we're singing at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and they're going, no. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Saturday night, 730, hope you'll come over there. Well, then everybody's interested. And whoa, Carnegie Hall, big deal. Lord, Expand my territory. Give me more opportunities to tell more people about who you are. Enlarge your territory. Let me challenge you to see the big picture, to get excited about all that God is doing around the world, and don't just be a spectator. Look at the heights. I mean, this is what they said. Hey, we could sit right here and be comfortable in Birmingham, Alabama, but God has called us to what's happening in Taiwan. We need to be a part of it. Don't have a short-sighted, myopic view of the world. When I was in New York City, I went to the One World Tower Observatory. The One World Tower was what was built of the rebuilt of the, um, uh, of the complex, of, of the World Trade Center complex. And it is the largest building in, the highest building, excuse me, in the Eastern Hemisphere. And you could go to the top of it to the observatory. And so you get on an elevator and you travel 102 floors in 47 seconds. Whoa. If you're in the balcony and you walk over the elevator, get on the elevator to get to the preschool on the first floor, it'll take you 55 seconds just for that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, I mean, it was like, boom, we're there and we're, and we're on the observatory. And, and so, uh, it, and it's called See Forever. See Forever. So, um, so I kind of wanted to see what Sea Forever was. So you get to the top, you get on the observatory, and it's a 360-degree view of, uh, of that whole skyline. And so you can get out and you can walk around, and you look out over the Manhattan skyline, and you keep on coming over here, and all of a sudden, you know, you see Queens and Brooklyn, and you see the Statue of Liberty, and you, you see um, uh, Staten Island, and you see New Jersey, and you just can circle around, and you see this incredible, incredible view and you look out over there and it's just amazing of how large that city is 
And you realize this, New York City, uh, the most important city, influential city in all the world, and the largest city in the United States, and you can just stand there and gaze over that, and, and you can see the, the miraculous nature of both the building part of it and the amazing potential of reaching people for Christ. Seems like this is what you'd want to do, and as I'm walking around, there's a 12-year-old who's sitting down, and he's sitting against uh, one of the posts, and he's looking in a screen that is five and a half feet, five and a half inches by two and a half inches, playing a video game. I'm looking at a 360 degree view of the largest city in America, the most influential city in the world, and just thinking of the potential. He's short-sighted on a five-and-a-half, two-and-a-half-inch screen, oblivious to that. Wow. You know, when I saw that, it was kind of sad. And when I kicked it out of his hands and crushed it, I knew it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'm just so sorry. I felt bad about it, but just, sorry, young guy. <laughs> Lift up over here. No, no, no. When I saw that, I thought that was sad as to what he was missing, what he was missing. And then I thought about our church. Our church has an amazing missions outreach that is touching all the world. There are people that are coming up to me saying, we want churches like Shades in our convention and in our state. We want to have that kind of missions outreach. We're, we're, we're wanting to follow things that you do. And I sit there and I think, and then we say, thank you. We're excited that God's allowing us to do this. But you see, what's sad is that a number of our members are just like that young boy to where he was in the observatory. He was there where you could see 360 degrees. And so he was a part of the One World Observatory. But he really wasn't engaged in it. He was just sitting there looking at his own little screen. And it's sad how many of our members, you hear what we do and you see the things that we do, but you know, you're just kind of focused in on just what's happening on your house, your block. Your life, that's it. Watching your little screen. And there is so much more out there that you just need to take a step. You just need to look up. And see, my hope and my challenge as we move into this next year, and we've got some initiatives that we're going to be talking about that will encourage you to get your eyes off the five and a half by two and a half screen and begin to stand up and look and see what's out there and take that step. Expand your territory, okay? He prayed this, I want you to expand my territory. Do you have the courage to be able to step up, look in, see the power of God that is moving in people's lives as the, go as the gospel is rushing through cities, communities, and churches all around the world and knowing that you have an opportunity to be a part of it, will you do it? Do you have the courage to pray enlarge my territory do you want your increased sphere of influence to be used to advance the gospel are you willing to be on the front lines of impacting advancing God's kingdom do you want to be on the front lines and see your front line is right where you are right now I understand that your front line it is your family your school your job your neighborhood your friends your peer group that's great are you engaged in that and then are you willing to be able to look beyond that and say, hey, I kind of be on front lines on something even further from here. It may be short term, or God may call you long term. God, give them that opportunity. I was sitting in the airport uh, flying uh, back from New York to Atlanta, and I was kind of mesmerized by what was happening to my left. There was a, a group of Delta employees, and uh, it was a pretty good size area, and they were, uh, they were there, they were smiling, they were happy, they had little areas set up, and people were coming in, and people were coming out, coming around, and they had food, they had giveaways, and there was all this joyful, happy stuff happening. So I was kind of intrigued, and I saw a sign, and the sign was FIT. Now, we have FIT here at our church, and it's called First Impression Team. They're the ones that uh, shake your hand uh, when you come in. Uh, they're the ones who will steal your car and move it to, no, no. They're the ones that, you know, they're shaking your hand. They're welcoming you. They get you in over here. We're just First Impression Team. We're trying to make you feel comfortable coming here. This is a group. It was FIT, and it was uh, called Frontline Involvement Team. 
frontline involvement team. And so I went and I asked the, the lady that was there, I said, can you explain to me what this is that you do? She said, oh, this is new. We're the frontline involvement team. And what we do is we encourage those frontline employees. You know, those people that are out there with the baggage claim, the people that are dealing with, uh, with, with customers and passengers. And so when they come in, we're just making them feel good. We're giving them food. We're encouraging them and giving them some of these gifts and stuff. And it was great. You could see it working. It, there was a lot of buzz going on. I said, that's a great idea. And I thought about that. And I said, that is a great idea for a business, but a terrible idea for the church and for Christianity. Because I would say most believers are on the front line involvement team to where we kind of enjoy sitting back cheering the people that are having to do the tough work to where we will say, I'll be there to pat you on the back when uh, you're making the financial sacrifices. I'll pat you on the back when you're the one that's sharing gospel conversations. I'll be there to encourage you when you're trying to live for the Lord and live a godly life. I'll be there to cheer for you when you're trying to make that stand for God. I'm always going to be here. I'm going to be cheering for you. Uh, you're the one that's sacrificing your time. You're sacrificing your comfort, and I'm going to cheer for you, and I'm going to be on that involvement team, that frontline involvement team, and I'm thanking you for being on the front lines. And then we feel pretty good about ourselves because we've encouraged them, and we hadn't done anything. And our, we've never been persecuted. We've never gone through difficult times. We've never taken those big steps for God, but we've been encouraging other people to do that. Now listen, you hear me clearly. We need to encourage those people, and I'm a head cheerleader for that type. We need to do that. But that is not an excuse for us not to also be on the front line. And the problem is, is that we feel like that we can stand back and take the encourager role and say, that must be my spiritual gift, and then we step away and say, great commission's not for me. Acts 1.8. That's not for me. Listen, it's for all of us as believers. And it was that way for Jabez. And he said, Lord, bless me indeed. And he said, I want you to enlarge my, my territory. I will be on the front lines and the front lines for you. All right? Number three is this. Let your hand be with me. He says, let your hand be with me. The hand of the Lord, what does that mean? It's a biblical term for God's power and presence. It's a biblical term for God's power and and presence. So read it that way. Let your power and your presence be with me. You say, why does he need that? Well, God bless me indeed. Now you've expanded my territory, and guess what? Ah, I need some help. I'm dependent on you. This is more than I expected. I can't do this in my own strength and power. And so you admit your total dependence on God, and then you look for his hand and for his presence. When you're talking about this, do this. Help me attempt something large enough that failure is guaranteed unless God steps in. You ever thought about that? <laughs> Help me attempt something large enough that failure is guaranteed unless God steps in. I want to be totally dependent on you, Lord. If everything you do in your life and it happens, you can figure out in man's strength how it happened, then you're not depending on God at all. You're going to walk through this entire life just depending on your own gifts and talents and abilities. So what he says, I want to do, I pray God's power be released to accomplish his will and bring him glory through all the seeming impossibilities. Make me dependent on the strong hand of God. Make me dependent on the strong hand of God. And I read this statement that jumped out to me, and it says, my surrendered need becomes God's unlimited opportunity. My surrendered need becomes God's unlimited opportunity. I am at a position to where, Lord, I need you. I'm totally dependent on you. I surrender my need to you, and all of a sudden God says, I've got an unlimited opportunity. This is incredible. You're going to allow me, God, to be able to work through you? You just better hang on. This is going to be amazing. You know, if you, if you, uh, if you turned over to the book of Joshua real quick, Joshua chapter 4, uh, you remember when uh, the children of Israel, they were in captivity over 400 years in Egypt. Moses led them all the way, uh, and they got to the edge of the promised land. And right there at the edge of the promised land, they voted 10 to 2 not to go in. So then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and then Moses died. Joshua took over, and they got right there to the edge, and they're ready to cross over in the promised land, okay? 
That's good. That covered Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the first two chapters of Joshua. Now, as he's right there, they're ready to go in. They said, we're going to cross at flood time. Are you kidding me? The Jordan River, it's about 90 feet wide, 90 to 100 feet wide, 10 feet deep. Except once a year it goes into flood stage and it's a mile wide. Now most people said, I like that 90 foot cross. I'm not too crazy about this one mile. And they said, trust me. And guess what they did? It was kind of like the Red Sea deal. As soon as the priest got there and stepped on the edge, all of a sudden it became dry land. And all of the people crossed over on dry land. And when all the people crossed on dry land, they got to the other side. He says, we're going to... uh, set uh, stones of remembrance, a memorial over here. And then in verses 21 through 24, this is what he says. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know that Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. So that, All the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So that, purpose clause, why did you do this? So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Let your hand be with me. Let me be totally dependent on you. Let me attempt something that is impossible except that you do that. And when that happens and you see the hand of the Lord, his power, his presence, then all of a sudden all the peoples kind of look up and go, wow, this is a mighty God. You say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. I'm so glad you asked because in Acts 11, if you looked over in Acts 11 real quick, Acts 11, persecution had broken out in the church and uh, people are starting to scatter. And they're picking up on some of the people and where they've gone. And when you get to Acts chapter 11, uh, in the 19th verse, this is what it says. Acts eleven nineteen. 19. One more page. It says, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. The gospel was, they thought, was just going to the Jews. But then there was a group that enlarged their territory. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Uh Uh-oh, watch out. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord is with them. What did they do? They enlarged their territory. It's not just for the Jews only. It's also for the Greeks. And so guess what? They preached powerfully. God's hand was on them. People began to be making decisions for Christ. Enlarge my territory and let your hand be with me. He is praying, Lord, let your hand be with me. Let your hand be with me and allow my surrendered need to know your unlimited opportunity. Last statement. Last thing he says is keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Keep me from harm, so I will be free from pain. Keep me from harm, what does that mean? That word harm means evil, adversity, distress, and hurt. Keep me from harm. I want you to connect all the dots. When we encroach on new territory for God, we are invading Satan's turf. And he says, I'm praying to be delivered from evil because I'm on the front lines in the midst of the battle. I will be experiencing more attacks from Satan, and I want supernatural protection. And so his prayer is, Lord, keep me out of the arena of temptation. Protect me from deception. Keep me safe from those temptations that pull at me. Keep me living in triumph and not in temptation and defeat. He said, Lord, all this prayer, I am putting myself on the front lines, and I know that I will be attacked. And I know that Satan does not like what's getting ready to happen. So I'm asking you to keep me from harm. I'm asking you to keep me from those temptations. Some people say, well, is that a soft prayer? Well, it's kind of the same thing Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. You're on the front lines, I want to keep you out of temptation. Psalm 119, verse 133 says it like this. Direct my footsteps according to your word, let no sin rule over me. 
Let no sin rule over. Let no sin capture me and take me captive. Guide my steps, Lord. Keep me from harm, and I'll be free from pain. Okay. Why don't you stay with me on this one? Keep me from pain. See if this makes sense. Pain is the bookends of this story. What did Jabez's name, what did it sound like? Pain. His life started in pain. Every time his mother said his name, it was a reminder of the difficult pregnancy that she had. And as a young guy, he probably blamed himself for that. And he felt bad about that. But you know, there was absolutely nothing that he did. None of that was his fault. That wasn't his fault at all. But yet I'm going to assume growing up, he probably dealt with self-esteem issues. He also dealt with probably some depression. He, he dealt with a lot of these feelings inside of him because of this pain that he thought that he had caused. He was always reminded of it. And then he got to a point to where as he prayed this prayer to God, he closed it here and he said, I don't want to have that pain. So maybe it's not the pain of being persecuted. Maybe it's the pain that he suffered earlier in life. And it was that constant reminder every time someone called his name. And what he is saying is, I want to be able to have victory over that pain, and I want to move forward in my relationship with you. And so keep me, uh, keep me free from pain. I don't want to go back. I don't go back to that guilt. I want to go back to those lies. I want to go back to that. I want to have victory over that. And so maybe that's a word for some of you here today. Because there are things that you have struggled with that really has either not been your fault, that you have been taking blame on, or is completely out of your hands, and yet you've either had guilt placed on you or placed some blame there. And be like Jabez and say, Lord, just free me from that pain. The Bible says that when we receive Christ, we become a new creation. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are new. And if there's some things in your past that you had done, and you've received Christ, he says, I take your sins and I put them as far as the east is from the west. And this is a new start. You are a new creation. And as Jabez is closing out that prayer, keep me free from pain. I think a part of that is I just don't want to experience that pain again. Keep me free from that. Lord, bless me indeed. Let me walk blamelessly. Let me trust Christ completely. Enlarge my territory. Increase my sphere of influence. Move me to the front lines of following Christ. Let your hand be with me. Let me be totally dependent on you and to experience your power in your presence and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Keep me safe from temptation to live in triumph. I know I've gone long, but I gotta tell you this last story that came across. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, it's a report from the mission field. These are the first, first couple lines of this report. The last two years have proved to be very different for us First, we had to deal with what seemed to be regular bombings and attacks in the city, followed by the attempted coup. All right, real quick, how many of you want to be in this position? Just raise your hand. <laughs> this is what they live with. This couple that's talking about has a teaching ministry to a specific language group in some dangerous company, countries. And due to things going on in the country for one year, they were unable to maintain face-to-face -face contact with the believers with whom they were teaching. And so there's a great frustration because they would gain so much from being face-to-face -face with these, and now they can't get out of their country. They can't do this. And for over a year, they've not been able to do face-to-face. -face. So they had to get creative. So they began doing teaching groups via Skype or something. They record the teaching, and they would send it to the groups. And it was definitely not the best way to have life-on-life -life relationships with the people they were working with, but at least they were able to give them good, solid biblical teaching. But then they began to receive requests from other groups, requesting access to the teaching for our weekly gatherings as well. 
Then the demand for more teaching videos and sessions continued to increase for more and more groups and locations. This was neither something we had planned nor expected, and when we began this temporary solution to our security and visa issues, again, perspective. He can use even our feeble attempts to continue to do the work he's placed on our hearts and do much more with it than we ever imagined. So last year, we were contacted by satellite broadcasting channels whose focus is to share the good news with that language group, as well as to provide solid, accurate teaching for these believers. They contacted us in the past for us to provide some teaching series for them, but we never sensed that he was leading us to do it at that time. Main sentence. However, this last time they approached us about this possibility, we felt as though he had been orchestrating all of the events of the previous year or so to guide us to this opportunity. Last year, he recorded 50 teaching episodes which began being broadcast this past January. The response has been unbelievable. The estimated audience is over 5 million viewers. <laughs> Amen. It's incredible. We were doing life on life with just a few folks. And then it just seemed like this curveball came. And we didn't know what to do. We just continued on. And all of a sudden, God was orchestrating everything. So now all of a sudden, five million viewers have this. Lord, bless me indeed. I'm ready to throw myself at you and on your will. Expand my territory. Expand that sphere of influence so that I can share more uh, for you. Keep your hand on me. I want to see the power and the presence of yours. I want to try something for you that destined to fail unless you take it. And then keep me from harm and free me from pain. Let me live a life of triumph and a life of victory. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this day for your word, and uh, I pray for our congregation. Well, I just believe there are people here who have been either walking through some difficult things, that today this could be a word to where you have come alongside of them and given them a word of comfort, and they're thankful for that. And Lord, I know there's some people here today that need a word of challenge. And if from what your word has said and what your spirit has spoken to their heart, that they need, they need to take that next step. They need to be bold in their praying. They need to be on their face before you and say, God, I want to be used by you. I'm tired of status quo. I don't want to come to the end of my life and just say, hey, I was just a bunch of six and sevens. That's all I was doing. I'm going to do something for you. I pray you grab those lives, Lord. Father, and there's some here who do not even have a relationship with you. And all of this is foreign. And yet they're hearing about a God who loves and challenges and saves people. And I would ask that today, that through the intersection of your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to them and draw them to yourself. And that they would want this wonderful gift of salvation that your son Jesus Christ has already provided for them. And that, and that when this service ends, that you will so strengthen them to say, you know, I've got some questions. That they would come up and they'd speak to us just when the service is over. And we have an opportunity to share with them. So we pray, Lord, that your spirit move through this congregation. And for all of us to know and understand that Jesus is better. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.